thanks for coming to my session. Um, uh, I'm really excited about this. Uh, I always find it amazing how many people sit in the back of the room. When I was an undergrad, I was one of those students. I always sat in the front. And uh, I never understood why anybody would want to sit in the back. I'm not asking, not asking anyone to move. Um, and later on, I started to understand, well, not everybody has the same eyesight that I do. Not everybody has the same sensitivity to hearing that, and like I don't have the same sensitivity, sensitivity to hearing that someone else might have. Um, there were a lot of things I hadn't thought about as a young student. I was like, why are you sitting in the back? Why are you sitting all the way back there? You're, you're, you're gonna miss something, or you're gonna fall asleep. At one point I was like, it's none of my business. I'm doing me. <laughs> But um, uh, I was talking with our earlier presenter and talking to her about my experience as, a, as an undergrad student. I went from the military into college and I was like, you gotta show up on time, you gotta finish your work, you gotta do all this stuff. And it never made any sense to me why somebody would show up to class late, why somebody would show up to class on time, but not have their work finished. Never made any sense to me. I was like, you, you gotta do this thing. I was commuting, I was working, uh, I was interning, I was doing all these things and I couldn't understand why fellow students who I hardly knew would have any problems with these things. When I got to grad school, I kinda had the same kinda attitude. I ran my own design firm for a little while and it was client, the client always got to have a deadline, got to meet the client demands, got to do that, can't, there aren't any excuses, got to be on time. So when I got to grad school, it was the same. Kind of had the same kind of uh, mindset. Then I started teaching and I had that mindset as I was teaching. Show up on time, get your work done, no excuses. And then a student came to me and said, she was working on a project and she actually, she didn't come to me, she was actually presenting in the classroom. And um, I had left the project open for them to choose their client. And she chose a, um, a, a nonprofit that deals with mental health because her father had committed suicide. And I was like, what? Really? I was like, I was heartbroken. Another semester down the line, another student came to me. Great student, always showed up on time, always did her work. She was always great. And then she, was good. she disappeared for two weeks. And I was like, man, I hope she's okay. She came to my office. She showed up to class one day. We had class. She came to my office afterwards, asked if she could talk to me. I said, of course. She had attempted suicide. I was like, ah, please don't do that. I like you. <laughs> Other people like you. No matter what's going on, people like you. Um, so that really started to open my eyes about being more empathetic and more understanding of those that I am impacting on a daily basis. If not a daily basis, at least a weekly basis. So um, when I started learning about diversity and inclusion, um, it was it was to help me be a better person, a better mentor for my students. I see my role in the classroom as a mentor, not an authoritarian figure, but to help students. Um, and then I took active learning pedagogy and learned about how that could help diversity and inclusion in the classroom. And so now I see these two things working in unison with one another. And it has made it impact on my classroom. My <laughs> the other day, I rearranged the, the tables. Uh, just yesterday, I rearranged the tables so we could all sit in, at the same table and talk about our projects that everyone was working on. And the students walked in, they're like, where do I sit? It's like, wherever you like. So some who usually sit on this side of the room were sitting on this side of the room, and, and even a couple of them said, 
I don't like this setup. It's like, it's just for one day, have a seat, and let's see how it goes. One of my other classrooms, I did the same thing, different class, different set of students, and they were like, this is really great. We love this. Maybe not every day, <laughs> but we love this. So um, that's what we're gonna talk about today, is how we can bring diversity into the classroom and help students feel more includes, included in the classroom. So, hello everyone, my name is Cesar Rivera. I am a designer, I'm a graphic designer. I teach interactive design, uh, motion graphics, corporate identity, and the senior capstone course where the students prepare their portfolios to look for work. I'm also an educator. I've been teaching now for, this is my fifth year officially teaching, taught for a year at Texas State before tenure track at Sam Houston State University. And I'm here to talk to you about diversity learning and active inclusion. Now, what does design have to do with diversity and inclusion? There is this, um, there is this technique, uh, this um, method that we use in design called human design thinking, or human-centered design, or design thinking, however you want to say it. It's about figuring out what the end user needs are. How do we make a product that helps the end user have a wonderful experience and be um, more of a brand ambassador for those products? So, how many of y'all have a smartphone? Smartphone? How many of y'all have applications on those smartphones? <coughs> Favorite, just anybody name off your favorite application on your smartphone, whether it's an Android or Apple, your favorite app? Pinterest? Insta? Insta, as the kids say? What's that? What do you say? I love Lone Star app. <laughs> oh, sure. Okay. My mic's too high. Okay. Design, human centered design thinking developed those things with the end user in mind not the designer in mind. My opinion about a design doesn't matter. My opinion about that design is based on research. Every, and every application, every great application that you have that you are really invested in, they thought about what do you need in order to function with that and interact with it. and be addicted to it on a daily basis. I just downloaded an app. Um, uh, it's T-Mobile Sync Up Drive, and I plug in this device to my car, and now I get all this information about my car, and I love it. <laughs> I, I, I drive a car from 2001, and it's wonderful. It's like I jumped from 2001 into 2019, and it was like, oh my god, this is great. <laughs> And now I'm a bit addicted to that right now. So not everyone thinks the same way I do. Not everyone thinks what I think. Not everyone has the same experiences as I do. How many of y'all have been in the military? How many of y'all have had military members in your family? So you kind of have an idea of what that's like, right? My mother worked, my mother was married to a man who was in the military and she worked civil service. Her whole career was spent working for the military, but she was never a military member herself. But does she understand how military members think? 
Yeah. When I told her I joined the military, she was like, you did what? Why didn't you talk to me before you did this? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why I did that. I knew, but I was in trouble. So, you know, what, what do your kids tell you when, you when you're in trouble? I don't know. We want to create mutual respect for uh, one another. We want to understand. We want to have that empathy for one another. When we have that human-centered design thinking, we are, create, we are trying to understand that person. Who's our end user? As faculty members, who are our end users? The students. And they all have commonalities, that they also have a lot of differences. And how do we get around, how do we think about all those differences? It's a lot to think about, right? What are their experiences? Are they first generation? Are they working? Um, do they have a lot? Do they have a lot of money where they don't have to worry about those things? Are their parents giving them a lot of a, a lot of support? Do they not have um, those parental influences in their lives? We don't know, and it's hard to have those conversations. So with active learning. Um, our approach, this is the approach to teaching where the students feel more included into the, into the discussion and the learning process. So we ask students to participate in all kinds of things, small and large, um, group, individual, small groups, large groups, small projects, large projects, all kinds of things. So these range from very complex to very simple things, and we're going to do some of those things today. Um, we have paired discussions. We have problem solving. Um, do case studies and team projects. How many of your students hate team projects? My students' attitudes have changed since I started doing some of these things. Some of them still don't like it. But when you implement certain things, you can help them understand the advantage to that. Because as young professionals, no matter what field they're going into, very rarely will they ever work by themselves. They'll be on a team, the junior member on that team, they're expected to do certain things before they're trust, entrusted with leading a team of their own, right? And that's any industry, graphic design, science, uh, criminal justice, on and on. Junior member, you're doing these things. Okay, now you're moving up. All right, we're going to entrust you with something small, then we're going to trust you with something larger, right? Let's take a minute to think about that for a little bit. Let's take 60 seconds. So go. Just think about it. Sixty seconds is a long time, isn't it? For a ten, for me to make a ten-second video in After Effects, uh, a motion graphic, takes me at least an hour. Ten seconds. And how <laughs> I had a student one time say, "You want to know how long ten seconds is?" And he waited ten seconds before he talked again. <laughs> 
So let's um, talk about some stereotype threats. Anybody know what stereotype threats are? What are stereotype threats? Anyone else? It's feeling that you might be at risk of confirming people's stereotypes. Students might be fear might be fear they exemplify or think they are at risk of being the stereotypes of their social groups. Uh, when I was in the military. My father is Puerto Rican. My mother, he was born on the island, Puerto Rican. My mother is of Mexican descent, but born in Waco, Texas. When I joined the military, all these guys from the island would talk to me. They would speak to me in Spanish. De donde eres? And asking where I was from and uh, immediately saw that I look very much like they do or people that they grew up with. I said, without, with this accent, this non-Texas accent, I'm from Texas, I'm from San Antonio, my father's from the island, my mother's from Texas, I've never been to the island. And they were like, what? They were completely baffled. They already made an, they made an assumption just based on the way I look. Jokingly, a friend, uh, one, of the, one of my colleagues in, in, the, in the university, he was completely, he's, he's a bit un-PC, and uh, he, I was saying, hey, we just got this new building. And I said, hey, your office is unlocked. Aren't you worried that somebody's gonna steal something? He says, yeah, you Hispanics. I'm afraid of you Hispanics coming in and stealing something. And I said, hey, hey, I'm Puerto Rican. Because I know he was joking. I know he was being just the cantankerous person he is. We also knew that nobody else was around. Is it okay? Is that okay with everyone? Probably not. But he knew that I wouldn't be offended because we've had those conversations. He knows who I am. He knows a lot about me. He doesn't know me completely, but he knows enough about me that I'm not going to be bothered by something like that. But that social, that stereotype of me being Hispanic, yeah, I have Mexican heritage, but I'm more Puerto Rican than I am Mexican. Let's take a minute to think about um, some of those stereotype threats. All right, I would like you to pair up with someone in the room. Uh, if you are like a third person over here, pair up with people next to you and talk about a time where a stereo, where you recognize a, a stereotype threat, whether that affected you or if you just recognized it in a situation. 
Okay, and let's take a couple of minutes to do that. Go. Let's bring it back together. Let's come back together, everybody. Everyone. Let's wrap up those conversations, everybody. Hello. Bueller. Bueller. Everybody. Can I get everyone's attention again, please? All right. How many of y'all felt a bit uncomfortable having that conversation? Anybody? Well, good. All right. Does anyone feel comfortable enough to share what you discussed? Go right ahead, sir. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else feel comfortable sharing?
Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Yeah, there's a there's definitely a big gap there. Um, there's definitely that stigma, um, that perceived stigma from others. Um, that's definitely something I think about as a tenure track faculty member. How do I treat others who are in the same profession? And to me, we're all in the same profession. We're all here to help our students understand whatever it is we're teaching. Um, when it comes to sharing in the classroom, allow your students to feel like they have the choice. Give them the choice to share. Don't, don't make it, in, in my opinion, don't make it such a requirement. Give them another opportunity in some way to share an experience. Ask them to write something. Ask them to post something on your, uh, we use Blackboard. What do y'all use here at Lone Star? I'm sorry? That system, whatever that is, you know, whatever that pedagogical system is, have them write something on a discussion board. Don't make them voice it. They may not feel comfortable voicing it. Um, when it comes to sharing, always say thank you. They're expressing something that could go way back to childhood and that deeply affects them, that they haven't shared even with their closest friends sometimes. Okay? So, oh, let's see. All right, what can we do to, to ensure, encourage, in, engagement and inclusion in the classroom. You're gonna to wanna to set some ground rules. And have, uh, so you're, you're saying here is, this is our society in this setting. And we are going to treat one another with mutual respect. And we aren't going to judge anybody we aren't going to say inappropriate things. We're just going to be the best people we can be in this classroom and understand one another. Do our best to understand one another because I may not understand your situation. I may be able to empathize with you, but I may not necessarily be able to sympathize with you. I was talking with one of my Caucasian female students one time, a young lady, she asked me, what's your experience like as a designer? What's your experience, what happened when you were in school? And so I was telling her some things that happened in school. And I said, you know, in this kind of setting, I'm the professor and you're the student, and I can completely sympathize with your plight of being a design student. It's tough. You're going to stay up for hours. You're going to be spending a lot of money on supplies. You're going to be doing all these things that you've never really experienced before. I can understand that. But I can't sympathize with you being a white male woman. I can empathize with that. I can make connection. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, a white female. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. A white female. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thanks for catching me. Um, I can, I, but I can empathize with her being a woman because my mother raised, a, raised my brother and I. My grandmother, my mother and my grandmother, my grandfather for a little while until he passed away, until my grandmother passed away when I was a teenager, and my mom. A lot of female influence. So I can... I can empathize with her in that way. I can understand what she is about to go through. But can I completely understand it? Nope. 
there's a uh, Hispanic male student in my class this semester. I can't, we have a lot of commonalities. There are a lot we have in common. I can't completely sympathize with his situation. We're from different cities. Um, we come from different backgrounds. But we have a lot of common background. So even though you may feel very, very connected to certain students, remember, you don't know everything about them. And be as um, accepting as possible and as understanding as possible. Oh, um, when, you're, when you're setting these ground rules, ask the students, how, what rules do you think we should have in the classroom? And you'll find that most of them will have the same ground rules that you set in your syllabi. And then you say, great, let's look at the syllabi. These things dun, 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 are in the syllabi. Dun, 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 dun. And very often I'll say in my syllabi, I'll get to the part where in my syllabi uh, where I talk about um, uh, academic honesty. And I say, I will not tolerate any, any form of discrimination in this classroom. If I witness that, you will ask to be, you will, uh, you, you'll, yeah, you will be asked to leave the classroom. If you refuse to leave the classroom, I will call university police to have you removed. And I don't want to do that. So please respect your fellow students. Manage hot moments. Who's had a hot moment in their classroom? Would, you, anybody, would any of y'all like to share a situation where it was a hot moment in your classroom? Yes, sir. I'm sorry? I teach a lot of life path students. Okay. I have executive function about disability or whatever term you want to use. And Wednesday in class, one of them was talking and was going on a little long. And another one interrupted it. And we had talked about being civil. And he turned around and was very angry and said, listen, Buster, I'm not done. Here's the situation. Go, go right ahead. So some of my colleagues have heard this story already. If you think about the first shot, by the fact that it happened, it's about to teach a class where the teacher teaches the production of education. And so it was really sketching um, the content about social problems that school students face and their students in the process of creation. And um, one of my students raised his hand to express his displeasure with what the textbook said about it. And so if we're to say how much he disliked it, he referred to the chapter as being 
So here's a situation that happened with me in the design course. It was a web design course, and I asked the students to find five successful websites, five poor websites, and two that were just absolutely terrible. And uh, one of the students brought in a site uh, that was religious-based. And we were talking about the design and all the flashy things, and it was just the design was absolutely terrible. Then one of the students started talking about the content, about that information that's on there, that it was referring to this particular religion, and they saw religion and were talking about the religion. And I said, OK, we need to stop. And we are here in the class to talk about design. We are not here to talk about anybody's um, beliefs or disbeliefs in certain religions. We can talk about the typography, the color, all those flashy photos, everything that's distracting about that. But we're not here to criticize the content, the information on there, because we don't know what everybody else's religion is in this classroom. We can criticize the way something is written. Maybe it's got poor grammar, but not the actual content. Cooled down after that, we went right back into talking about design. But yes, sometimes you'll wind up talking your whole hour about how to be more inclusive how to be more accepting. And in some, in a lot of areas, it's um, in all areas, it's very important. But in some areas, you have to be more aware of it than in others. So be the AC in those moments. Keep your calm, keep your cool. Even if it offends you, you still got to remain calm and collected. You, you are the person that everyone in that classroom is looking up to. All right, so we did that. Uh, microaggressions. So we want, um, you, we want to identify our own biases. Right? Like I was saying earlier, get the work done, be on time. I recognize that. That's me. I realize that's me. Do we have deadlines in class? Sure. Show up on time. Don't be late. I'm going to mark off if you're late. <laughs> but when a student shows up on a day that we, it's not a deadline and I've asked for them to be ready with something and they're not quite ready, hey, hey, what happened? Why did you show up? Why did you show up late? Is there something that's going on? What's, what, why, why? Right? A scooter broke. A scooter broke. <laughs> we were talking about scooters earlier. Um, there's this one student. Oh, she's chronically late every day. <laughs> she's been going, she, I've had her for the last two years in courses, and almost every day she's late. <laughs> and um, so, I asked her the other day, I said, what, what is it? Why can you not show up on time to class? And she's never really real late. She's like five minutes late. Why can't you just show up a little bit earlier? And she says, well, I commute. And I said, OK. <laughs> I commuted my whole time. I was an undergrad and a grad student. And I was always on time. I was always early. And she said, well, like today I forgot my wallet. <laughs> and it's kind of, I, I kind of just accept it now that she's going to be late and it's not really, it doesn't um, interrupt the class. But I tried to explain to her, like, you know, when you get out and you're working as a professional, this chronic problem that you have might affect your work performance. So you're going to want to be careful of that. Um, and I try to always bring that back to when you're done here, 
it's not a big deal here, and you're making your mistakes here, which is great. I completely think that all students should make their mistakes here, and then be ready to go out into the workforce. But identify your own biases. Um, uh, I try to be accepting in a lot of ways. I've been in a lot of different um, kinds of industry. I was a bartender for 10 years. I worked at a fine dining restaurant, at an all women's strip club, an all male strip club, a gay club, um, a gaming place. Like uh, I worked at Dave and Buster's. I've interacted with all kinds of people. I worked at an all uh, at a mainly African American nightclub. Been engaged with all kinds of people. It's made me a very accepting person. Also, my mom. The first time a gay man, a gay young man, hit on me was in high school. And I was really offended. I was like, what's wrong with that guy? And I went home and I talked to my mom. My mom worked at a hair salon at the time. <laughs> she worked with a lot of gay men. She sat me down and she said, look, it doesn't matter who hits on you. It doesn't matter who thinks you're attractive. You should always gracefully say, thank you. I appreciate that. And then say, I'm not attracted to you. I'm just not that person. That was my first lesson as a young man. And it stays with me today. I don't know if I could have ever worked at that gay club when I was in my 20s. Hadn't I had that conversation with my mother. So do I still have those biases? No, not at all. Guys hit on me at the bar all the time. <laughs> there was one guy, there was one guy, he worked at the bar, he was a daytime bartender, I was the nighttime bartender, and he, every day I went to work, he would hit on me. And I was like, dude, no. <laughs> And at first, I was really nice. I was like, yeah, you know, I appreciate it. And, uh, and afterwards, I was like, dude, no. It's like, but I just want to cuddle. Like, no. <laughs> Would anyone like to share something with a microaggression? Thank you. Situation with a microaggression, whether that affected you or you recognized your your bias. Yes, ma'am. All right, so I've been told I only have 10 minutes left, so I'm gonna get through the rest of these very quickly, the rest of my slides. Um, pair your students diversely. So if you see, you, we all have them. We have these little cliques of students sitting in the classroom, right? Tell them to break up. Like you're breaking up for the day and you're gonna pair up with this person over here. Get people to um, engage in class that they don't typically engage with. All right, so now time for the big reveal. Y'all have been participating in active learning in this presentation. Um, the examples are the one minute reflection. Studies show that for if you uh, just give students one minute in between chunks of information, they are more likely to retain that information for long periods of time. And you know how 60 seconds, how long 60 seconds is. So just one minute, the think, pair, share. Think about it for one minute, pair up with someone like we did in here, talk about your experiences, and then share that. 
being inclusive, okay, making sure that everyone feels accepted. Thank you very much, and I'd like to open up the floor for any questions. Yes, ma'am. Last semester was the first time um, I really started um, implementing some new active learning techniques. Because as I took that pedagogical training, I realized that I was already doing some of those things. And I got better at those things, but learned some new things. Um, one of those was asking students constantly, what do you think? Did this work for you? Did you like it? Do you think you're going to do better the next time around? Finding that information really helps. So last semester, I had one group of students. And now they were the juniors, and now they're the seniors. And I had them talk to the juniors this semester. I had a couple of them come in because interactive design, they're learning how to code in HTML and CSS. And they're very stressed out about learning that, learning code and having to do math and, and thinking with a different part of their brains and not being visual all that stuff. So I had the, the senior, a couple of the seniors come in and, and just have a Q&A with them. Hey, what do you want to know? I'm here to share my experience with you. Here's what happened when we were in class. Here's what you can expect to happen. Students, my student, the, the students in that course have better buy-in now because they're not hearing it from me, they're hearing it from their peers about what the class is going to be like. I noticed the other day that our student, our student design group had their first meeting and they started, they're doing some of those active learning things that I did in class. They're doing that in the meetings and I'm like, whoa. <laughs> did I answer your question? Okay, good, yes. And I mix it up. So there's, there are days, our, my design courses are three hours long, each course. So there have been times where I talk the whole three hours. And then there are other times that we just work in class. And then there are other times where it's split up. Or we just sit down and we have a conversation. Mix, if you, I find that if you mix it up with lecture, with days to work in class, days just to ask the professor questions, they have a better, in my opinion, in my experience, they just have a better, a more, um, uh, a more engaging experience, a more fulfilling experience. Does that help? Any other questions? Yes.
And the Last semester um, in corporate identity, we're talking about branding, and there are these different concepts of branding. And so I broke my class up into five teams, and I said, "You're going to look up this part of branding. You're going to look up this part, and da 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 da." After they, after I gave them about five minutes to look up all the information, I said, "Okay, now you're going to come up in front of the class, and you're going to present that information." First, they looked completely lost. They were like, what are we doing? This, I just don't get it. First team comes up and was like, we'll go first, I guess. They come up and they present their information. And I said, any of the other teams see a connection to this part of branding? Yeah. And so they start talking a little bit. They're just talking a little bit, a little bit here and there. It's like, okay, thanks. Next team, come up. They present. See any, does the team that already presented see connections? Yeah, there's this and this and then over here. There and there's this and this and they're having this conversation. It calms down, third team. By the third team, there's this big conversation about how all of these things are connected and the other two teams haven't even presented yet. Having that kind of reaction makes it all, because I was like, I don't know how this is gonna go, but we're gonna try it. And you don't know what's going to happen until you try it. You don't know what that student reaction is going to be until you try something. Why keep on doing the same things over and over and over? What's that saying in science? Like, exactly. You're, you're insane for doing that, right? That, that's the saying. I'm not saying people in this room are insane. <laughs> but trying something different, trying something, it changes up your routine also. It makes court, the coursework more fulfilling for you. You know, how many times have you walked into class and like, I'm giving this lecture for the 10th time, for the 100th time, right? When you start mixing it up, the other day, this, this past Thursday, when I sat my interactive um, students down in, I rearranged the table so we could all sit at the table. When we all sat at the table together, we were talking about um, we were talking about pairing type and how that worked on the web and all this stuff. And then I, at the end of it, we finished up in about an hour and a half. And I, and then I, at the end of it, I asked, "What did you think? How did you like this?" And they were like, "This was really cool." I don't think it'll. The students were saying, "I don't think it'll work every time. Every time we have information that we that you need to share with us." But for this particular thing, it was really great. And that kind of information, that finding that end user information is only going to make the next course better. And I tell them, the more you share with me, the better it, it may not be great for you right now, but that class that comes in after you is going to have a better experience. You're, going, you're having impact on the next course on the next set of students, on that alum, on that esprit de corps. I go to a great school. I go to a great program. I, we, pro, this program produces great design students. And that's what you want. You want people to say the same thing about Lone Star. Man, Lone Star College, they have the best professors. I wish that was a four-year school. I went to San Antonio College before I went to um, Texas State. I went to San Antonio College before I went to Texas State, and whew, some of those professors were great. I have two degrees from a two-year college. Great professors. I think y'all are doing wonderful work. Thank you very much. Let me know if you have any questions. <laughs>